Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Ajay, Ajay Shinovaskamurti. He's a PhD student at uh, UPF Barcelona. And he's part of this uh, large project called Comp Music, which is across uh, his institute as well as uh, a Turkish institute and a couple of IITs in India on computational music and processing music in different ways. So I'll let him tell you about what he's working on. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So, I'm trying to ask uh, an important and an interesting question here. Uh, can actually machines learn Indian classical music? And uh, so, as she said, I'm from Music Technology Group and University of Pompe Fabra in Barcelona. I work with Professor Xavier Serra uh, as a part of the Comp Music project. Uh, so, when I say learn there, uh, it's in two senses of the word. One is the human side, I would say, in the understanding of music understanding in the sense of the science of music wherein we try to answer some basic questions on uh, human perception and cognition saying why is music musical or what is the connection between emotions and music and can a machine find out what kind of emotion can come out of what kind of music and uh, we also want to shed light on some cultural specific aspects wherein we would say what is it that is unique to Indian music which is not there in other forms of music or how do we compare to music genres and then cultures? And the most important question is how do we improvise? And then what is it that actually is needed for the main process of improvisation? And where does the virtuosity in a musician come from? Is it, does it, is it, can we actually model it statistically or otherwise? And then see if we can get more light into that. And when I say learn, the other part is from the machine side, which is called the machine listening. The, the, the visual counterpart of this is computer vision, as we know, which is for developing different tools for analysis, both melodic, rhythmic analysis, or harmonic analysis. And this is where we try to build statistical models to actually study music in a more systematic way. Uh, is there a larger question, can machines understand music or classical music before thinking? Of course, yeah, that's always there. Uh, the bigger question is, can machines understand emotions? And then music and emotions are very closely tied. And then that's the biggest question. Then comes music and then the other. No, so, okay, um, without going into a lot of controversies, but is that question, has that question been studied? Yes. And what's the general view? Uh, the general view would be, I would say, Right now, it, it's it's not even close to actually what uh, what we actually intended to. But the counterpart question, wherein by studying, if we can actually make machines learn music, we'll be able to shed more light into the way we perceive music. And then there has been some amount of work there. So learn music means what? Uh, learn music, or I mean, understand music in the sense of which what is what is it in music that actually appeals to everyone in the world. Some, they, they would like some or the other form of music. And then what is it that makes me learn uh, or uh, like classical music and then not uh, like another form of music? So these kind of very basic wait, questions. I, sorry, I'm going to wait on this. But I mainly wanted to know if the larger question has been studied and what is the, view, what is the state of the art on that? I am not very sure on that. But you then... You picked Indian classical music. Yeah. I was wondering you picked it because it somehow uniquely different from the other types of music or is it just one genre as opposed to? Uh, so that's a question which we need to answer. We, I don't know yet actually. So okay. is it, I mean, is it just one, one form of music or one music culture or can it actually, can models which have been developed for other cultures, can it be extended to this in terms of perception no, and no. cognition? So in other words, you're saying that how are models that have been developed, that's what I'm, I'm trying to understand. Uh, whether the, you know, there are two questions, right? One is can, can machines understand music? And then the question, can machines understand Indian classical music? Yes. Maybe they're both equally in an unknown state or one is just trying to understand. Yeah, I would say 
machines understanding Indian classical music is a little more behind when it comes to other forms of music. Yes, or no one working on it. But so anyway, yeah. So and, and then we actually move on to some problems which we can. Uh, we we mainly work on two traditions of music. Uh, Carnatic and Hindustani. There are a lot of folk traditions in India, I mean, whole lot of folk traditions. But the reason we choose these two are because they are still in performance practice in the social context and they are evolving. And there is a quite a big following for each of these traditions. And people still learn them and then perform them. Uh, and uh, and it's, a, it's a little different from, I mean, most of the other traditions in India, like some of the folk music is borrowed from classical music removing all the rules which are rules and the structure which they are in the classical music traditions and it, it has well defined structure which makes it a little more easier to study I mean at, at least as a musicologist it's easier to study classical music traditions and there is significant scope for improvisation so this is the balance there is structure and there is freedom to actually improvise and then that that is what makes it uh, a good candidate to study and if you if we actually look at the current state of the art in uh, the music information research community uh, the algorithms and lot of tools do not generalize to other traditions and uh, most of them have reached a state of saturation so by developing some of the tools for uh, Indian classical music we wanted to see if we can actually take those uh, insights which we get in studying uh, our music back into other cultures and then see if we can improve the state of the art there as well. And uh, by developing culture specific tools we can actually target different audience in different countries and that's how we go. And uh, there are certain problems which are unique to Indian classical music. The hierarchical rhythmic structure which is there in uh, uh, Indian music is, is much more prominent and then pronounced and uh, the concept of a raga and the intonation and the gamakas are much more uh, significant in our uh, music traditions. So I will be discussing two problems, one with a scientific flavor but with an engineering approach wherein we try to uh, model melody continuation in Hindustani vocal compositions. Uh, this is, is a problem in which we try to model human creativity and then see if how do we, how do people improvise by taking a purely engineering approach of statistical modeling and then to see the structure in music. Uh, it can be used for raga and style modeling and uh, it actually tries to get the predictive predictability and tries to get the structure in music. And one of the main applications for this is automatic accompaniment wherein uh, there's a lead singer or a lead melody and then there's an accompaniment which could be a rhythmic accompaniment or a melodic accompaniment and then there can be a jugal bandhi between those two in a nice little way. The other problem is again a signal processing problem uh, wherein we try to do rhythm modeling for uh, Indian classical music and uh, this is a task I would say it's a precursor to most of the rhythm based tasks uh, in which we try to do segmentation of pieces or segmentation of entire concerts so this has to be done before that and uh, so this could also help us to extract some of the rhythmic parameters like which is the tala of the kriti or wh what are the different phrases, what is the phrase length, what is the nade which is the subbeat structure or which are the regions where there is a high tempo and there is a crescendo, these, these kind of questions can be answered by modeling the rhythm. Uh, so most of the rhythm modeling work will also finally lead to what is called uh, studying similarity in a broader sense of how do I compare two different songs and then say they are similar perceptually that's the final aim what are the parameters that I look for when I say two songs are similar and then rhythmic similarity is one aspect of that and then we also try to see if we can uh, go, go to that. So uh, if I take the broad gamut of MIR tasks so, so to say the, the two problems which I am discussing actually are cover up those the, the problems which are marked in red whereas the, there is a whole lot of other problems which are being worked on but then th those are not being discussed here and then so rhythmic analysis it would touch upon onset detection and beat tracking, tala recognition 
and uh, viewpoint modeling would actually touch upon automatic accompaniment or style modeling. Whereas these import, there are other problems in melodic and harmonic analysis which are quite important, and then they can be look, they can be handled separately actually. I can't sing. I I am a percussionist, so rhythm is my strength. I would say. So that, that's why I do rhythmic analysis. Oh, if you had told me, I would have got got my madangam here. Sorry. Just kidding. So let let's actually look at the first problem. Uh, so the problem here that we're looking at is given a melody. Uh, can we actually predict the note which is coming next? This is done all the time. Sitting in a concert, you are listening to an alap, you say, okay, this is the note which is coming next, and if it comes, you get that nice feeling that actually uh, I could sing the alap or I could get the raga nicely. Or so, so this is the fun part, but it actually answers deeper questions saying, is there a predictable structure which I can decipher automatically uh, in music? And uh, in a way, I mean, the, the broad goal or the, the final aim is to actually see if we can model improvisation with which you can we can do a whole lot of things in, in the sense of creating different styles or uh, this is mainly a generative problem wherein you would try to generate melodies in, in and in the process you would like to understand what's going on so uh, the to put it in a more engineering way given a context of notes which have come can I actually get uh, get the next note, or which is too specific? So, can I get the predictive distribution over the entire symbol set of the next symbol? And for this, uh, the experiments were done on uh, North Indian classical music melodic sequences, or mainly symbolic sequences, uh, what, what are called bandishes. They are short sequences of uh, melodies, which are actually skeletal compositions, which are uh, improvised upon. And music, as we know, has variable length context and then patterns and structure. So we have to model this uh, variable length of history which we have to look at and uh, so that is why we choose an approach which is called uh, multiple viewpoint modeling. This is not a new approach. Uh, this can be used for language modeling. So I would put this problem as dis discovering the language of music without actually attaching the, the performance aspect to it since we are looking at only the symbolic uh, music here. And as I said, the applications are automatic accompaniment and uh, style modeling of different musicians, different genres, different gharanas. Uh, so essentially the idea is to take different parameters of music, which are called viewpoints. For example, the pitch, which actually ranges from the sa to the higher octave sa, and durations, which are quantized in this case and the interval which is actually the interval between the previous and the current note the jump in the in, in terms of the number of semitones and contour which actually says if the melody is going up the scale or down the scale and there can be cross viewpoints these are different parameters over which we build models and then we combine them and there can be cross viewpoints which actually do a cross of note and the duration which would say a quarter note in charja pitch so this is a particular symbol in, in that particular space. So oh, what we use are uh, variable length Markov models, which are capable of taking different length context. Markov models are uh, Markov models have a specific uh, history which can be used. The nth order Markov model. Here we have an ensemble of Markov models, which are built at different orders, and then uh, we have a way of combining them. And uh, an easy way to store variable length Markov models which, which have different length context would be suffix trees. It's just a way of storing them. And uh, as with any Markov model based approach, bigrams, trigrams in language models, we, uh, we, we hit the problem of uh, zero frequency wherein we don't have certain scene transitions. And then when we actually see them in the test sequence, we, we need a way to handle them. And typically. Uh, not particularly. Actually, I would I can talk about some of these in a little more detail, but uh, here it is just an a just a way of actually so, so putting one together. Thing you might be saying, in getting, I mean, uh, as opposed to say language. I mean, obviously it makes you think about speech, right? But as yes. opposed to speech, um, 
ragas and so on have a certain grammar to them as we learned from another talk that Anirajit, like, that is you can you are only allowed certain notes and all these things. Yes. Right? Uh, uh, that, 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 you know, does, do these approaches take that into account like you recognize the raga and then you uh, do the thing or yeah. they are they more blind to it? So the aim is to actually discover all those structures which right. we are looking at okay. in a statistical way by giving examples. So I mean that, that's, no, that's, that's the approach okay, in statistical way. Statistical way could broadly mean um, you hear things like this so it will continue like this. But ragas have a much more uh, rigid or uh, not too rigid but you know they have some kind of a framework. Right? Yes. Would, would you not be better off discovering okay this is so and so raga and therefore not like that. Yeah, that, that's a byproduct of this modeling. So this modeling is actually, I mean, it, it's an envelope on this. this, this it can automatically discover ragas, okay. and then it can it automatically. Explicitly try to recognize the ragas. No. So it's purely that's why I was asking, right? I mean, it, it is, is there no value in explicitly recognizing the raga? Uh, explicit raga recognition has a lot of value, as I'll show you. But uh, what I'm saying is, given a sequence, raga rec the the raga label comes as a byproduct. And then you need, you need not explicitly actually go and then do a raga recognition on that. So as soon as the symbol sequences start coming, at some point of time, very soon, you, you can say this is this particular raga. And then after that, you can still continue working on that. Once, once you do that, can you use the, um, I mean, just to bootstrap, you use that, the recognition and you use that to prove other bits. I think that's kind of what yeah. Anandam is getting at. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah, that can be done. Yeah. So in fact, uh, we try to do, uh, I'll, I'll show you no, that. It's all, always possible that there is a counterintuitive result which says doing so does not actually improve your performance. <laughs> in this case, that's not true. I mean, getting the raga recognized, if you recognize the raga a priori, it's, it's much better. Uh, and uh, I mean, in, in all compositions, so as even though we say it's in a particular raga, specific to a composition, there are certain motifs which are more often used in the in the in the framework of the present composition, and uh, so we wanted to capture that as well. So one of the ways of doing that is to have an ensemble of models which are called long-term and short-term models. Long-term models are you can visualize it in the way of it's a it's a model which can be built on the entire raga. And uh, it's quite broad. It, it has ho a, a bunch of different kinds of motifs which can be possible within the framework of the raga. And then, uh, so it's, it's a little more general. But when it comes to the current composition, what, well, what we would do would be to build a model on the current composition as the composition progresses, which actually gives a better idea of what's coming next. If the comp most of the time compositions will have repeating phrases, and then this tries to model those phrases. And then that's a short term model. Uh, so the idea here is to have all the viewpoints, different viewpoints which we see here, and uh, combine those viewpoint predictions, build a short term and a long term model for each of these viewpoints, and then combine them to make a final prediction. And the way we combine them would is actually based on the entropy of each of those models uh, at the present uh, predictions, I mean at the predi prediction time. So uh, what, what, what's done is to actually take the entropy of the distribution for each viewpoint at each time and then uh, we actually weight it and then in, a, in, a, in fact it's inverse weighting so, the, uh, so that a, a model which is more sure that a particular uh, symbol is coming would have a peakier distribution and lesser entropy and then that model would get a higher weightage when it comes to uh, predicting the next symbol. So, and you, you do a weighted average over uh, the weights which we have computed. What was the input you used for this? Uh, so, we built a database of symbolic melodies from Bhatkandes book. So, those were used. What's Pmax at the end? Pmax is the, I mean, H of Pmax would be the maximum entropy for a flat distribution. And then H of Pm is the entropy of the current distribution, predictive distribution. So, it's, it's inverse weighted. Uh, cross? No, the cross. Uh, cross entropy? Yeah. So, cross entropy is for uh, evaluation. 
when I have a new test sequence, the way I can evaluate it on, on that is to evaluate the cross entropy of the model on this sequence and then uh, average it over the sequence and then. Now when you are combining the models right, the short term and the long term, you do not do any mutual information of cross entropy on that? Uh, no. How do you combine? So the combination is based on the entropy. Of individual ones? Yeah, individual models, not, not mutual. So I mean, so in a way, this can be uh, uh, this can be seen as a mixture of experts, wherein each model is trying to give you a predictive distribution, and then you're trying to build one predictive distribution out of all these models, and then the way you combine it is based on entropy of each of these. I mean, making looking at how sure each model is about the prediction. So these are the different viewpoints which were uh, used, and then that's the range of symbols. And as we the cross viewpoints are quite effective in prediction, but the only problem is the search space actually combinatorially increases for uh, every cross viewpoint. Uh, if we actually look at an example here of uh, how the the short term model works, so to say, so the, what we have there is a Yaman composition. It, so I mean, it's not very good to visualize it here. It would have been better if you actually heard it. But what we can see is there are some patterns which are repeating, for example, this and then this is a repetition, exact repetition. So, so if you take a Yaman Bandish, mm. uh, so is this like, let's say it has four lines. Yes. And so is this, uh, what is the x axis? Oh, this is, the uh, x axis is the sample number, note number, so to say. If it has 100 notes, four lines, so that is what it and is. And the y axis? Y axis is just a label, it is octave folded. Oh. Okay. And then note number. So, I mean, this is. So, and that's the knee. One, I mean, I don't. When you think about speech, right? A lot of these type of things would apply. There's one would think, at least, that there's inherently more randomness in speech strings mm. than in music. Yes. That may or may not be true. And so, the very statistical techniques, which really, you know, have to deal with that randomness. I wonder, for music, if you need not go that extreme and somehow rely on more regular structure. You know, yeah, so, so I don't know. Yeah, makes sense to take it close to this. It, it does if you view the broader picture, but when you actually zoom in, uh, music is all about, uh, I mean, as my advisor would say, it's music is all about unexpectedness okay. when you are not expecting it. So even though there is a structure, there will be one note which would be changed to give you that the feel of music in that particular uh, utterance. So even though at a broader level you might say there are a lot of repetitions, when you actually go into each of the phrase or phrases, there is a small change in every phrase. Yes, no, but I just, the, the key word is the, the small change, right? Yes, to, if you so can. I'm, I'm just wondering if these techniques that you're talking about uh, benefit from the structure while looking for a small change or they're just blindly statistical in the sense that they treat it as if it's a speech speech. Yeah, so that is something which we have to build it, but then this does not actually do that. It just takes it as sequences. It could as well be used on uh, probably s sequences of uh, um, genes, I mean sequences of nucleotides in a gene. But I am not sure what you are telling is really correct because uh, here it seems that uh, it is more rigid because the number of uh, notes are fewer. No, and uh, also I mean, music is music partly because there is a structure. Yes. Yeah. But speech, uh, the speech you get the information from the context. Context is also so varied. You, your marginalized probabilities are over, uh, over no, I agree, I agree. But I am just, I agree there is a certain amount of context and I agree there is a certain amount of uh, statistical variability. But the, at least intuitively, the, the macro scale structure of music and speech seem very different. But his complexity values are what exactly we get for language models. Really yes. Right? But he uses yeah. these kind of models though. But he is using like quite big windows. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now. So, um, yeah. So that the other question if I have since we start. Yeah. So in, in terms of a, since you are taking a bandish, a bandish itself is quite short. So what is short term and long term? So. Uh, Short term on a bandish is built on the bandish itself as the bandish progresses. Right. So which is the reason we will see that short term models do not 
work really well for bandishes. But uh, if we take long khayals probably, the entire composition, then I think short term models work really well. In fact, short term models work really well for tabla sequences. If you have a, so a solo tabla performance, if you actually transcribe it and then run a short term model on that, it, it actually gets almost every stroke which is coming. That's because of the structure which is inherent in uh, tabla sequences. So it depends on the type of data. So, but then the models as such can be generalized, but they have you have to actually look into certain specific details. Uh, so the data set had it, it was quite modest. I would say it just had 128 bandishes and about 13,000 um, nodes, and uh, kanswaras, which are grace nodes, which actually you touch the grace node and then move on to the next node. So they were all ignored. Uh, the, they are just ornaments, and uh, so. If we, if these are all symbolic data, uh, which were actually transcribed directly from Bhatkande's uh, uh, Hindustani Sangeet Padati book, uh, so we studied dif four different ragas, and uh, these are some of the results. So I put the results of long-term and short-term models separately. Uh, these actually are different viewpoints, and then combination of viewpoints. The N C I N N cross T would mean that I've taken the node contour interval and the cross point, cross view point of note and duration together in actually putting out these uh, perplexity values. Perplexity is just 2 power uh, cross entropy. So, so in a way it says the number of symbols which the model gets confused uh, are different VLMM orders. So when I say a 7th order VLMM it actually considers 7 different symbols of the past in actually deciding what is coming next. And uh, 7 is the maximum number it could actually back off and then stop at, at a different order as well if it actually does not find a 7 length sequence. Uh, what we see is uh, the cross entropy actually increases after a particular order. This is mainly due to this, the kind of data we have. This kind of a structure is not seen in tabla sequences and this is more pronounced in, in terms of in case of short term models in which uh, the perplexity increases with the model order and uh, longer sequences and longer context do not actually help predicting what is coming next. So in fact if we probably run this on longer uh, compositions we might be able to actually generalize and then uh, see the performance improve. Uh, so the average perplexity as we can see is about 4 or 3.8 so out of the 12 symbols it can actually come down to 3 or I mean up to 4 symbols kind of a uh, uh, perplexity. Uh, so this is well, well, one of the questions which we were trying to answer in the sense of can we actually do a RAG recognition. So whatever we did till now we had RAG specific models built and then we tested on the same RAG. Here what we are trying to do is to actually get the RAG from the sequence and then do a uh, do the same kind of prediction or you take the entire global data set and then say a raga is a quite a broad kind of a definition. So we would call it composition clusters which are 4 or 5 compositions which actually cluster together in, with, in some similarity measure which actually in a way you can say those are similar compositions and then when a new test composition comes in we would try to soft decision I mean we would try to make a soft decision among all the other clusters and then see uh, if we can improve the performance and then what we saw was the best performance is got when you actually use a specific RAG model and then uh, all the other performances are intermediate and then so actually having a RAG label is, is actually useful and uh, if we can get the RAGA information before we start the prediction it is always helpful. Uh, so I will just quickly move on to the next topic actually uh, which is uh, rhythm modeling. Uh, if we actually look at rhythm in uh, Indian classical music it has this hierarchical multi time scale structure wherein you would have a long phrase then when you split it down you would have a beat then you would further you can further go down and then see, see the strokes. So this kind of a structure can be seen. And uh, as we know the most basic aspect of Indian rhythm is Tala which is an abstraction of rhythm 
and it's it actually encapsulates most of the aspects which we have to study in uh, uh, our music and since the the rhythmic framework the tala framework itself is quite sophisticated it has multiple parameters which define a tala and we don't actually define uh, any absolute tempo but the tala which is actually shown by the performer or in in case of hindustani music the the performer itself so that's the one, that's the one which actually defines the tempo and i would say a basic description of uh, rhythm in indian music would be to actually get this perceived tempo which you cannot exactly define in terms of beats per minute or something but then you can still actually give a number and then say okay it is it is actually going at this speed and uh, get the beat beat is actually the beats of the tala or uh, or a or a counterpart of that and uh, the long term periodicity refers to the phrase cycle boundaries and sub beat structure refers to the what's called a nade which is the the inherent the the sub beat structure every every beat would have those many number of strokes so i mean uh, so this is how a general description system would look like so this is what is defined for western music so to say there are multiple different uh, blocks here where starting from feature extraction to time signature determination and uh, indian music would actually have something similar to this but then would be a little different because time signature you you have you can actually draw parallels and then uh, but then those parallels are not particularly uh, straight forward so what i would say is i would move on to uh, our approach in which we try to build a similar model for tala so description previous slide so this is uh, is this well established as the one as we are doing the tempo detection or beat oh no this is just a just rhythm just description a system. system i mean this actually has all the blocks so to say i mean i i got this so that it's it's a nice example of to see what are the things which can be done in rhythm so to say uh, as long when when it comes to plain signal processing uh, and uh, so all of these are different things beat tracking is one part so pulse track it's called pulse tracking there and then uh, so it is just one part of this uh so what we try to do was to take uh and then say we will not assign a tala label we will not say this particular kriti is in adi tala or this particular bandish is in teen tal but what we said was we'll try to get the periodic structure and then give numbers instead of labels giving a label would mean uh, we'll have to put in a little more of knowledge based processing wherein uh, we don't get confused for a metrical level up or a metrical level down of the same beat and then misclassify the tala uh, and we just didn't want to say this is a, this has a nade of a, this has a tisha nade which is a three beat and uh, eight beat cycle which is an adi tala but then we we wanted to say we it, this has this particular structure wherein it could be 3 with this particular confidence score and then we make a soft decision based on that and this would also help if there are multiple uh, periodicities in the song so the the way one of the standard procedures to is to do an onset detection which tries to get the note onsets and then we try to estimate the tempo and based on the tempo we would do a beat tracking uh beat tracking would mean it's a periodic uh pulse which is introduced on the song wherein you could segment out and then we can so those are like the units of rhythm which can be used for a uh, whole lot of other purposes so beat tracking in western music is defined as the 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 times in the music at which you can actually tap your foot or uh, move your head, move your head so those are the times which which are called beats in uh, music i'll i'll give you an example soon so uh once we have the beats what we can do is to we have the beats now we can zoom into the beats and then we can get the nade of the song and then we can look at uh, uh, the the structure among the beats and then we can get the long term periodicity so th that is the idea we started out with and uh, i mean so if we if i can actually explain it with a block diagram what we would typically do is this is audio here and uh, we would actually get a detection function which is a form of uh, 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 which which is based on some signal processing which we do on the signal it's typically based on spectral flux which actually enhances the onsets and 
it's easier to actually detect onsets on the detection function rather than the audio itself. So once we have the detection function, we would do a tempo induction which actually measures, it's based on some form of autocorrelation wherein we would try to get the tempo of the song. And uh, based on the tempo. Detection function as opposed to audio itself. Right? So audio would have, uh, so in, in a detection function, you would actually take a particular band of frequencies and then you compute the spectral flux. Uh, that's the easiest detection function. It, so if there's a phase change, so if there's a hit somewhere with a drum, there would be a sudden phase change and then you would, that would get enhanced when you get the detection function. And by actually getting the peaks of detection function, you can get the onsets. Audio, what do you mean? Audio, it's not very prominent. No, what is audio? When, you say audio is when I say audio, it's a song. So it's a musical piece. No, but in the context of this analysis, right? What is it? What is different between audio and a detection function? Yeah. A detection function is derived from the audio signal okay. by doing some processing on that, okay. uh, and uh, all the peaks which I which I need to detect the onsets are more prominent in the detection function. Whereas audio doing a processing audio would mean what? Processing audio would mean you take uh, you frame it out and then you compute its uh, frequency. I mean you you would probably do a DFT on that and then get the spectrogram essentially and then that's the detection function. Which would have all possible frequencies whereas here he only wants the frequency of the that no, I, I, think, I think the phase change is what I understood yeah. but I just didn't know the term for audio versus detection function. So I mean yeah so this is to audio would have much more information but I don't want all those information but I want to I want only the onset information yeah. which so that's why I do this processing. Sorry, I have to go to another event. Sure, sure, please. And uh, so once we once we have the tempo, we would do a beat tracking on that. And uh, so beat beat locations would actually define a particular structure to the music. And then I, what we would do is to compute what's called a beat similarity matrix. Uh, beat similarity matrix, uh, I'll show you, well, I'll show the beat similarity matrix uh, in a while. Then on the other side, we have the detection function and then from which we do an onset detection. And uh, from these onsets, at the beat period from which we can get from the tempo, we would try to zoom in and then see, see and then uh, we would compute a histogram of onsets from which we can actually get to know the subbeat structure of the song. So the idea here is to get both the long term structure which can be got from beats and the subbeat structure which can be got from the onset intervals. Uh, this is an example beat similarity matrix. The way you find it is to get the beat locations and then chop off the spectrogram at those locations and then you would do a cross correlation of each a beat i with a beat j and then you would put it at the I, ij location here in this matrix. So a structure in this matrix for example the, the diagonal would mean a self uh, I mean it's, it's the autocorrelation whereas a structure which you can see at a different di on a different diagonal would actually give you an idea of uh, the the long term periodicity. It would mean the beat 0 or beat 1 is correlated with the beat n there which would mean the beats are repeating which which means that there is a, there's a long term structure. It is at 16 here. So and in order to emphasize this you would just pull it down and then you would plot the diagonal and then you would see the periodicity at a particular uh, I mean on a particular diagonal number, sub-diagonal and that indicates the long term periodicity here. So what is done here is, uh, so this is also not very particularly, so if you have a periodicity at 16, it is very likely that you would have a periodicity at 32 or at 8 or at 4, so, so that is the structure in music. Uh, so instead of one cycle, you are now counting two cycles, that is the way to look at it. So what you would do would be to do a comb filtering on that in which you would actually pick peaks and then uh, pick, pick peaks at different multiples so that you would get this 
and then in this you would actually see on a, on a correct peak at 16 here and uh, the subbeat structure is actually got from um, the histogram uh, you would plot the histogram of the onset intervals the time between two onsets and based on the time between two onsets you will be able to get the subbeat structure uh, wherein I would actually go to the beat period and then go at half the beat period or one third or it's, it's, a, it's instead of actually looking at multiples I would look at the inverse multiples and then that is how I can get the subbeat structure. Let me play this example so that you can so listen to this is in a Tishra Nade so to say it's it's a 1 to 3 1 to 3 1 to 3 3 by 4 kind of a time signature and uh, periodicity here it's it's an Aditala actually so but it's actually double counting uh, I've marked the beats with a click so those are the beats and then uh, it, it's, it's actually finding a periodicity at 16 whereas the periodicity is actually for this particular song it's 6 and 8 so it has half counted and it's, it has double counted so to say. Uh, so we have we can evaluate this based on a particular uh, so we go back to this curve and then we can rank order different candidates and then th this is for the purpose of an evaluation on a data set to actually see how it's performing but the main important thing to be noticed here is the metrical level ambiguity wherein we saw it in that particular song even though the song had a subbeat periodicity of 6 and the long term periodicity of 8 it was confused to be 3 and 16 though it's right for a musician it's not right so uh, the signal actually shows both periodicities whereas for a musician you would actually the musician would want it to be 6 and 8 rather than 3 and 16 so this is present in most of the beat tracking algorithms and uh, there is no I mean it's it, this particular thing is not there in the signal this is a knowledge which we which we have to put yeah, in but from the, the 6 to 8 thing comes from the fact that from the melody that's playing also right yes so uh, you got 3 and 16 because you're just looking at the onset of the beat no uh, with the mel with your so it's, it's flute right so I mean it would detect the onset of the flute as well so it, it's not just you know, the what I'm saying is if you take the way that the melody is playing right so you could say that after every eight beats the melody is sort of similar yes you see some similarity between the melody across eight beats right so if you could combine this with that sort of stuff which you did earlier with of uh, detecting similarity or periodicity of the melody itself mm -hmm. that might help you come come up with these numbers 6 and 8 as opposed to 3 and 6 yeah so the 6 and 8 I mean the error here was because the beat tracker actually double counted instead of waiting for two periods it just put two beats in the same period which is kind of uh, which is kind of problem with a beat tracker always so it, what she is saying is can you I use get the that. melody to correct that I, I get what you are saying but then uh, uh, melody in terms of the phrasing has to be considered it's the phrase which actually changes at, at 8 beats and that's the reason why I would say it's 6 and 8 right yeah so, so first, first you have to recognize the phrase structure and remember that this phrase structure is repeating at this this beat and then correct this yeah that's actually Right now, right now you are doing it on symbolic level, right? No, this is on audio. No, 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 this is on audio. The previous, the previous, work, is yeah, previous work is on symbolic level. Symbolic analysis here? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, what is it? No, the one way to handle this is to actually, uh, actually constrain the beat tracker yeah. uh, to actually track onsets which are uh, musically more relevant. And uh, the way to do that is to so when we are actually doing a beat tracking you would have to give a range of tempo values which are possible and that is where most of the time the algorithm uh, gets stuck when in double counting or half counting uh, if we can give the right range of tempo then it would do well and uh, that's a bigger big problem for Indian music because different songs can be sung in different tempo yeah. so, so right now I am actually looking at that problem how do we actually solve the metrical level ambiguity problem and it's it's quite it's it's exactly similar to the octave confusion problem in melodies so 
wherein uh, the tonic would be detected at the higher octave or the lower octave. Yeah. But that's easier because the range there is not that. Right. Th I mean, that's easier because the range there is known to us. Yeah. So here, it's it's e even here we know it to an extent, but then we need to actually fine tune it. Uh, so, so the performance isn't very very significantly good because it's still you need to work a lot on this. Uh, one thing which needs to be noticed is that the subbit structure is easier to find than the long term periodicity and uh, Carnatic music is a little difficult than the other music I considered was light classical music uh, which is mostly based on Hindustani ragas but then it has the black accompaniment and it's, it's all folk songs and then light classical music songs, bhajans and then those kind of things which are pretty much easier. Uh, Carnatic music it's harder because you would not see a very similar beat structure in every uh, after the end of every cycle because the Madangam keeps changing I mean that's the way the Madangam player is trained to play and even the phrases do not actually repeat so that's the reason why the performance isn't very great so I'll have to look at what needs to be done there. How would it compare to uh, not light Uh, I haven't checked that actually. So the, the one of the main problems I faced was to if you take uh, if we actually take very slow bandishes, uh, onset detector actually doesn't work really well, and then we'll have to look at how do we get the onsets in those kind of very slow bandishes. One example, it doesn't even sometimes uh, this has been tried on Western classical. If there are a lot of strings it doesn't perform very well on the detector. So uh, we'll have to handle those problems first and then actually move on to Hindustani music. So what is the onset detection algorithm you used for? Uh, it's just a form of spectral flux. You get the spectral flux and then do a median filtering on that okay. to enhance the peaks and then you do a peak detection. Very straightforward. Uh, yeah, just just an example here. Again, there's a double counting here. Again, because of the tempo, I would count it this way. So instead of a four and four, it it would actually give me. I mean it, it double counts here. So instead of putting one beat, it has put two beats in the same time period. That's because this song is pretty slow and the range of tempo for which the algorithm works, I mean the algorithm looks for is, is a higher tempo. So and uh, the same tala can be, you can put it at double speed and then uh, that's what it has detected. So here in so this particular example, I'm surprised that your onset detection didn't find larger peaks in the, at the actual points because again, uh, you know, because the melody is playing also along uh, the same the same beat that you gave as opposed mm. to the beat that was mm. detected, which was double the speed, right? Didn't the onset detector find higher peaks? It would find all the peaks actually. It would find all the peaks, and uh, so the tempo, so the entire beat tracking is based on an assumed range of tempo and that tempo is centered around 120 beats per minute mm -hmm. uh, and you would do a weighting function saying lower tempos are more likelier than right. higher tempos in, in fact it's the other way around and I mean the tapering on the lower side is smoother whereas on the other higher side it's slower okay. it, you put a Rayleigh function on the tempo tempo curve so which is the reason if if it actually is not in the range of 120 what this this is like 70 or 80 so it would actually double up and then say it's not 70 or 80 but it's 140 because 140 is closer to 120 and it, it gets a higher weight and then it would track the same it would track the beats at 140 beats per minute so and we have so this example i i chose this because we, we don't have an automatic way of uh, finding the exact tempo at, uh, or the metrical level at which I need to track. One way is to actually put an absolute uh, 
restriction and then say this is the range I'm looking at and then I have to track that or the other way is to actually do a uh, automatically detect the tempo range and then work on it and this is an odd, odd uh, meter it's, it's in Khanda Chapu this is at the right level I would try so it tracks five beats in the cycle that's right so uh, the other two examples are not uh, I mean one is money which is uh, a very odd signature it, it's seven and then Charleston is another example wherein the the beat tracker actually tracks the offbeat so so th these are I mean uh, I've given these examples to just to show what are the kinds of problems which can actually come up in doing so uh, money it found the seven right, the seven, right? Oh. yeah we actually quickly play that mm -hmm. find seven it's easier, it's easier. the onsets yeah. are really very strong yeah, the base is defined. very very yeah. well defined so uh, so I actually so that actually concludes most of my talk this is just a list of the tools and data sets which can be used uh, if, uh, if you are interested in pursuing uh, MIR further uh, MIR toolbox is a MATLAB toolbox Econest API is uh, is I mean it's, it's an API which can be used for they have computed a whole lot of features on a lot of songs and then it can be used for uh, music recommendation kind of tasks and MIDI toolbox is another MATLAB toolbox to read and write MIDI and we have Android ADK all for uh, mobile development iOS SDK and Windows SDK uh, this is a list of this has a list of tools which uh, they have listed a set of tools which can be used and data sets uh, the new the, the new data set is the million song data set which has a million songs I mean not the songs but only the features so which can be used for large scale experiments uh, most of the MIR uh, has been done on Beatles and US pop data set so far it's, it's a pretty significant it has about 120 songs from Beatles and US pop has a, sig a similar number and uh, Indian music uh, Parag has actually developed two or three databases Bandish TV is the one I used GT Rag DB and uh, Tabla databases are available and Com Music is the uh, project I work for and then there are some resources there as well and Ismir conference is the main uh, conference for the MIR community and there's a mailing list which you can join in and uh, there's a competition which is held every year on different MIR tasks and then you could participate in that as well it's called the Mirex uh, MIR exchange Um, actually so I started doing that but then I had to leave it halfway uh, the idea there was to synthesize melodies out of the bandishes which were transcribed it would help in multiple different ways a lot of ways but then I could only get till the MIDI stage I mean I have MIDI examples of bandishes which do not sound like a bandish at all I mean so if you ask me but I, I think her question was slightly different as in bandish DB has uh, actually, there are some audio examples of the bandishes that are transcribed. In this? Yeah. No, these are, this is a symbolic database. Oh, okay. Is this from Oh, okay. okay. Uh, this is the database I used for my experiment. So there is something called bandish base that I got confused with. So, bandishbase.com uh, actually has the number of transcribed. Oh, if you want sung examples, there are a lot of websites which There's you can. A few audio examples. But then you don't have Just bandish, there are a lot of databases. Yeah. Transcription is not available. You will have bandishes listed whole archives but then uh, yeah so these are some of the references I think uh, yeah and yeah that's it I have from my side.